I think so. Yep. By golly, happy equinox to us. It is time now for the SVAU Astro Hour. I'm Ron Heron, your host this 136th episode of a big two and a half year long now Monday morning blog we do for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Southern California, actually Central California's South Coast Longtime Astronomy and Telescope Club. I call it 93 million miles of fun in the sun. Uh, we will introduce other supporters here and members in a moment here. Uh, we got one missing board member and uh, into the new year. Let's talk about what's going to go on here for this 136th show for First Friday. Uh, actually, First Friday is right around the corner, a general meeting, but uh, this happens to be the 25th of September, and it runs through Sunday, October 2nd, and we are just full of it. Boy, I got to tell you, happiness just switched over to a fall of uh, this past week, latest on Osiris Rex, Houston, it has landed, deepest, darkest Utah. We got pictures, sampler probe sent out to Bennu, the asteroid, other asteroids we're going to talk about this week. Making science news, Comet Nishimura swung by the sun, giving NASA's stereo satellite a nice photograph we'll share with you. A new star flaring up in a distant galaxy lit up the whole thing like a new LED bulb. It's a new exoplanet uh, in another galaxy that is forming uh, inside. It's making moons, I think. Plus, um, the moon is coming into fall harvest, right? That's what it's going to be called. Let's meet the gang. On the screen with me is our beloved president of six or seven years, Jerry Wilson, <laughs> vintage uh, veteran of the uh, research and development places out on Hollister and Galita. And I'll wait till the last introduction for the man on the phone. Uh, here is Tim Crawford, who runs or used to run the Tuesday night. Hi, Tim. Hi. Uh, Jerry is married to Pat Porgy. Tim is married to Karen. They're all supporters. And we uh, <clears throat> we have Tom Whittemore, who edits our uh, incredible monthly newsletter these days. Hiya, Tom. Good morning. I know, I know that you pined for your old uh, college job there in the lab at Westmont. However, maybe in your next life. And we did lose uh, Tim Murdoch, I guess. He's married to Ma uh, Bonnie. Tom is married to Maureen. I'm married to this couch most of the day. <laughs> and by golly, I... For some reason, didn't know if they were going to land that probe or not, but it landed perfectly in the desert. We'll we'll be talking about that. You got the pictures last minute, right? You're going to show them, Mr. President? Yes. All right. Well, let's go to the uh, silly stuff first, because Jerry Wilson likes to have a good laugh like all of us, and he forwards these silly science cartoons to us. I guess we lost Bruce Murdoch. Uh, Earth's first science fair? No. What have we got here? Science panel, two aliens and an Indian chief. Uh, oh, okay. Is this the brain talking to her? Yeah, it's her brain. Her brain. Hey, her brain. Are, are you falling her. asleep? And the, she says back to the brain, yes, now shut up. And he says, the brain says, what if our entire solar system is just an atom, huh? huh? Well, I'm <laughs> sure we've all experienced that. We want to go to sleep, but we can't turn our brain off. I know that well, every night. I recap everything. My God. Can you imagine what it must be like to have a, a photographic memory, remember everything? My God. No, I can't. I've got this the opposite. Did you send this one to me? I, can't I may me. not have. It was last night. That might have been the one that came as gobbledygook. It yeah, could be. I, yeah, okay. There's a cat inside two hula hoops. Hula hoops. That's a Venn diagram. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> Being an a-hole, since we don't say asshole on this show, being a son of a baby. <laughs> Good job. All right. Well, maybe we can make that a subject. You can tell me what the hell this is all about. This is not... Uh, uh, no, the intersection of these two properties, being an asshole and being a cuddly baby. Oh, that's I see. The cat. The cat <laughs> is in some of those. We, you got to go on nextdoor.com, the local social media outlet. Boy, they have cats on there all I the time. I got this on my arm from playing with my cat the other day. Well, we've all seen Chuck McPartland. Oh, Chuck's not here today. He's just going in for jury yeah. duty, but he's been obliterated by a black cat that he's allergic to. Oh, this is unreal. Oh, take a quick look at the wheels. We yes, sir. Get, we got to get one of those at Concourse de Elegance somewhere, or one of those car shows on <laughs> Street. This Who's is the, an Escher mobile. Okay, yeah. Escher was the guy. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had his real name. I was trying to remember. What, what, was he into drugs? He must have been. All right, here we go. This would be uh, the way a, a nerd who's sitting at, I guess this is a technical geek, right? That uh, computerized. This is how they look at him. He's really another planet guy, right? An exo weirdo alien. Mm -hmm. this, and the bottom panel shows how he views them all Neanderthals, <laughs> cavemen, and even a dinosaur. Ugh. Can you make that a little larger? So I go, ah, oh, not that large. Here we go. Okay, ma'am. He pulled her over, and the cop says, I'm going to ask you to walk a straight line, please. Then I'm going to ask you, please uh, bisect that line with a perpendicular line that slopes to the uh, equation y equals 3x plus 5. And if you can't do it, you're going to jail. Get <laughs> wow. is, that, is there some? Oh, never mind. Okay. No. Here's the old fashioned type of astronomy telescopes inside where you actually looked in the rear end and she says looking up you know bob you can just say happy national astronomy day you don't need to add to those who observe okay i don't remember getting that maybe i did okay yeah. we're on the plane we're on the plane and here's what they hear this is your pilot speaking yeah uh, working from <laughs> home today hope you don't <laughs> that debit kept him home too Elon Musk made that plane. Here's Earth's first science fair. If you look carefully, we got the three guys, one that invented the pointy sticks, the sticks that became our spear. That was Ugamug. And then the fire inventor, man, he had fun at these fires, these uh, science fairs. He's in the middle. And the guy that invented the wheel, and but not how to spell it correctly, grinning. <laughs> I guess he got the gold medal, the wheel. Somebody came up with a wheel, some weird, faceless, nameless, Cro-Magnon, man, I guess. Okay, what is this one? Some did and some didn't. You know, the pre-Columbian cultures in the Americas here never invented the wheel. They never used it. Well, they'd also have to invent the, the axle. Put it <laughs> axle. Yeah. All right, here we got four dark looks at the sky and two people talking about it. Since the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago, the universe has been expanding. We know that, but like a balloon being inflated. The distance, it goes on, between galaxies as well as atoms, is increasing every moment of every day. The universe is expanding, and so is everything in it. And he's talking to her, even me, he says. And she says, or maybe you're just eating too much. Nope, it's science. Nutrisystem is not working. God bless. Here are the two aliens stepping off the ship, meeting an American indigenous Indian chief, saying, I don't bother. We're not staying long. We're just having our smoke <laughs> break yes. outside the ship yes. <laughs> holy cow have you guys uh seen that new yellowstone show they're bringing cigarettes back because I, I noticed they all went away from did you not have another one there no that's it okay shall we do the breaking news first and, get, and since you added that after everything else we waited last minute for osiris rex our little visit to an asteroid and i got some questions Okay, I can ask him now or wait till you're into the middle of your well, let's I'll wait till you're in the middle. I got one big question how they got it. Here we go. And this is thinking, our official pictures of fall, fall colors. Equinox first. Yeah, equinox. Sure. Uh, the equinox was the 23rd, which is what five for Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and what that means, this is a a nice sketch I found on the internet shows um, the Earth tilted at its 23 degree angle. So this is the axis of rotation. The Earth goes round. Um, let's see, actually, it goes this way. Is that right? This goes way? to the east. Goes to the east. OK, so it goes this way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the things in the east seem to rise. That's right. So, um, and th this is the celestial equator, which is the Earth's equator, projected into the sky. And this is this represents the plane of the ecliptic. The ecliptic is not a small circle just around the Earth. This is just the intersection of this spherical volume with the ecliptic plane. The sun is off here in the ecliptic in the on the ecliptic, and so this shows that when it's summertime. In the um, northern hemisphere, the sun shines directly down on the northern hemisphere, and the Earth will rotate 
down here, and this will be uh, a warm part of the year because the sun shines directly on it. The southern hemisphere down here will be having winter, and the transition between the two is where the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator. This is from the point of view of the sun. So if we if the sun is off here, we get one of the seasons, and in this case, we get summer. But here, we the sun is right over the equator um, at the uh, equinox. And what is it, the vernal? Autumnal equinox. Right. And yeah. so <clears throat> we are now transitioning to a winter. So the earth is, um, and the winter will be where the sun, the ecliptic or the equator is tipped up like this. <clears throat> because the sunlight will come in here and it'll come in obliquely so we get less heat. People well, the who live in the, the uh, days and nights are the same length. People who live in the tropics around the equator uh, have no concept of four seasons. They get two, hot and hotter. <laughs> <laughs> hot and not as hot. It's like they've never seen snow or or ice form, probably. You know, except in a fridge. You know, Ron, I used to think before I got into the astronomy club, I used to think that the that the Earth would tilt on like wobble like a, a top and tilt back and forth 23 and a half degrees before I realized no as you go around the earth is just maintaining a tilt and as it goes around its orbit that positions it differently on the, on the earth and that my whole concept was kind of uh, backwards well the earth does wobble but it's well, not that not not the not the wa that wobble Bruce I just yeah, I know, that's, that's uh, tens of oh, that's 23,000 years I forget what the number is 26. 26. 25 25 I think yeah 26. <laughs> so anyway this this white line right here that represents the earth's pole is also the earth's angular momentum vector and you can have <clears throat> if if the tilt changes slightly or if the earth speeds up or slows down then this vector will change its direction or it will change its length for when it represents angular momentum. And this is a classical system because the angular momentum of the earth can assume any value. If this were a teeny tiny little electron spinning around, it couldn't maintain any value of its angular momentum. It could only have certain angular momentums. And that's what quantum mechanics is because quantum mechanics for very small things, it it, the thing that's quantified is angular momentum. So you couldn't make the Earth tilt if it were a small thing. You couldn't make it tilt to any angle, only allowed angles. So if the Earth were an electron, it could be either spin up or spin down, straight up or straight down, rotate one way or the other. You can't tilt like this. If it were something uh, that had more states in it, like an atom, you could tilt at given things. But not, but they are discreetly defined. There's no continuum of angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Now, that deer in the headlight looks on everybody's face. <laughs> I found a nice the description of uh, the uh, quantization in that, you know, uh, uh, an electron can either be a particle or it can be a wave. And if you take the wave uh, way of doing it, the orbit in which it is has to be an integral number of wavelengths. It can't be a fractional. So there's only certain energies that it can have and, and satisfy that uh, requirement. Yeah. But I would I would correct, I would change one word. You're not saying it wrong, but they are both a wave and a particle. Exactly. Not, not right, right. Either. It's duality. Right. A wavicle. It's a wavicle. Well, what it means in terms of classical terms, that is how we think of our everyday life. We don't have a good understanding of that. We don't see it every day, so we have to believe the math. Somehow we went from the equinox to quantum mechanics. <laughs> yep. Just an illustrative difference. I think you guys are quantum entangled with each other. I really do. <laughs> it depends on how, how well I slept the night before. Well, let me just hit you with one quick question. Um, a lot of the planets, in fact, probably all of them are tilted and have seasons. They even say, I think uh, Saturn has seasons. Yeah, they all do technically, yes. Well, except yeah, Uranus is tilted like 90 degrees, isn't it? Or yeah. nearly that. That's that would be my question. Does does Uranus get any kind of changes? Yeah. 
It's it not does. always tilted. Well, it always is tilted 90 degrees. Sometimes so it's always, it looks like it's rolling along its orbit. So is one side of it uh, always dark and the other is always facing the sun? One no, pole. It's, it's, it's an it's extreme like case. What? It's stable. It's stable in its orbit. So it's yeah. always pointing the same direction. So as it goes around uh, uh, 180 degrees from the sun, the part of it that's illuminated changes by 180 degrees. So it yeah. it doesn't really have days and nights. It's got seasons, I guess you call it. What, would, would the axis of its rotation be in line with its orbit and be pointed in the direction it's moving, or is it pointed twice, to the sun? Twice. It's like a broken clock. It's right twice a day. The, right. um, okay. It's like a top spinning. The axis, the axis points directly at the sun or directly away from the sun or directly along its orbit. But I doubt they see any seasonal changes on those gas giants. I think it's too cloudy up there. Yeah, a little cloudy. What, we're looking at a surface of Bennu the asteroid here, right? This is Bennu the before asteroid. You, before with... you go away from that, I, there's a, an experiment you can do that's very nice. You take a bicycle wheel and spin it and just hold your finger under one of the, the axles, and you one side of the axle, and it'll precess. It'll want to go around, but it will stay vertical. That's because of its angular momentum. That's gyroscopic. Yeah. Isn't that the gyroscopic principle? Well, it's called gyroscopic moment, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. It's hard to turn it in your hands. Well, if you turn it, it's the th yeah. the, it wants to turn 90 degrees from the way you push on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the big news that happened yesterday, right? Boy, talk about cutting-edge cosmology, gentlemen, happening. Thank right you, Bruce. <laughs> okay. Too much information, right? It, What's it, that? Too much information. No, <laughs> no. Is this a Good real add is this a real picture or an artist's rendering? Well, this is a real picture, but it's computer generated, I think. There it's was no really there was no photographer waiting on Bennu to, to get its landing and, and samples selection. And you so notice it comes from the CI lab. I got which you. Is right. a computer imaging. So this represents Bennu. Bennu landed, and then it had a um a container that it opened, or and um, it then it shot pressurized nitrogen through a nozzle to stir up the surface, and then it tried to get the pebbles and dust to settle into this container, and it succeeded too much. They got it so much in there they couldn't get it closed again. They had to work at getting the container closed, but this shows the um, debris thrown up by the Bennu during its sample collection mode. Hmm. So it's not a vacuum per se, because my question would have been, how in the world do you vacuum something in a vacuum? You don't vacuum it, you blow it up in the air. It's like a big so sneeze. No, not, not, there's no air to blow it in, but I'll, I know well, what you're saying. No, we brought the air along with us. <laughs> Mostly nitrogen, just like our atmosphere, right? Okay. It was all nitrogen. And they, so didn't we got, any, they didn't want any water in it. But we got nine ounces, didn't we? Somewhere between uh, 0.4 and 1 kilogram. Well, I have no idea how many ounces are in a kilogram. That's about almost a gallon, isn't 2. it? 2.2 pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So they're taking it to Houston and they're going to unseal it in a vacuum and not try to pollute it or corrupt yep. it? Hmm. What are they it's in the clean room it? right now. Uh, that 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 interested me. I think actually you've got a picture of that later. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so okay. this show, this shows a picture of Bennu. It's really just a pile of rubble, all held together gravitationally, and uh, it was looser apparently than people that designed um, Osiris Rex planned on. Easier to collect. This is the parking lot on Bennu where they landed. So they have put down here the collection area and compared it to a parking stalls and vehicles as if there was a parking lot. Oh, oh okay. And but this it is orbited, where... It orbited for many, many years? To, but no. Finding, no. Not years? It took, it took years to get there. No, I, it did orbit for a while. Yeah, it did orbit. It, 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 once it got there, it orbited the asteroid, is what I'm yeah. saying, trying to find... Yeah, they want to decide where they're going to land. Yeah. Yeah. And how did that happen? Is there AI-induced stuff on board, a uh, computer that makes the decision, or did we make it here? Uh, that I don't know. 
I, I would guess um I would guess that um we selected the area from pictures and that and then the AI actually you know, operated it to land because of the time delay you can't operate the vehicle in real time from from earth I think they said this thing is is like 500 feet across I think that's its size oh, it's hmm. the size of uh, the Empire State Building but of course that's yeah. a long skinny thing but uh, wow just to give you an idea, I think the scale is like, I think it's 500. I don't know if it's 500 meters or 500 feet. I think it's 500 feet. You mean across oh, the this circle? Uh, the diameter of Bennu. Oh, the Bennu, yeah. Yeah, the the area here is much smaller. Yeah. Well, a typical vehicle they're showing there, which is uh, like a Suburban, is about 20 feet long. Yeah. So you can scale from that. It looks like the... Uh, it's probably around two or three hundred feet on a side from the area they're showing. <laughs> Not a lot of gravity on there. Enough. Well, you know, I think that better looks like a charcoal briquette, <laughs> <laughs> a crumbly one. Yeah, but they they got it back, and we're going to learn something. I'm not sure. Yeah. What. Okay, there it so is. So this is this answers your orbit question. This is a timeline from September 2018. Here's when it arrived at Bennu in around the 1st of December in 2018. This is 2019. This is 2020, where the first sample collection occurred in October of 2020. So preliminary survey, orbital A, detailed survey, baseball diamond, detailed survey, equatorial stations, orbital B, orbital C, recon, rehearsals, that is the practice of everything. And then um, they did the, then the sample collection window and they took the sample. So somewhere in here between orbital A and orbital B and orbital C and the rehearsals, they landed. They don't pick that point out there. So I assume the surveys, the detailed survey, equatorial stations and stuff, that was it when it was in orbit. So you're right, it did orbit for a couple of years or at least a, while, a year and a half. Plus, uh, gentlemen, we're looking at a spacecraft that is at least three separate parts put together, maybe four. The, mm -hmm. whole, kit, the whole kit and caboodle arrived and orbited, like you said. Then it had to let go of one part to go down below while the main part stayed above or the whole thing went down below. Okay, so that's not two parts. And but when it was coming, then the whole thing, all three or four parts, including the probe that landed here, went back to Earth together, or did anything get left behind on Bennu? The probe was sent back to Earth. It's not clear that the entire spacecraft went back. Maybe that'll we'll get that in another chart. But well, the spacecraft is continuing its mission. It's not at Earth, or it's not going to stay at Earth if it is at Earth. Well, some, some here, somehow that cone has all the brains inside of it to... <clears throat> no, the cone is the sample return mission. That's the sample return capsule. You'll see it coming up. Okay, I know that, but did it have everything in it, including the retro rockets and putting no, it... No, the retro the rockets and all that stuff are here. Okay. So oh, the solar I, panels. I get it. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the whole thing came back. Just We didn't leave anything behind. I, Something had intentionally no. Something had to align that that cone to land in Utah of all places. It could have landed anywhere. And you know, we do pretty good by just aiming it and having a few little rockets on it to, to fine tune its, its path. Uh, we we send things to Mars sometimes with no mid course correction for seven months, and it hits right on the dot. Newton wow. knew what he was doing. Well, this is, these are radar images of Apophis taken wow. in 2020, I believe, uh, when it passed close to Earth. And Apophis, you know, is the one that caused the most concern about maybe it's going to hit the Earth. This was taken in March 2021. And it's going to come back again to the Earth, I think, in somewhere like, and I'm just off the top of my head, 2039. Um, and so that's the one we're really interested in as a maybe too close. Well, you say too close in between us and the moon inside the moon's orbit? Yeah. Whoa, that is close. Yeah. 
So this represents, this is a brief history of all everything that we've sent that looks at um, asteroids. Mm. So these, these, it has the asteroids down here, according to size, Ceres, Vesta, uh, can't, Matilda, can't read the other one, um, Ida, Eros, so we're Star getting down here toward Bennu. There's Bennu right there. It's very small. These are the asteroid explorers. There's the Dawn spacecraft, which orbited both Vesta and Ceres. Oh, no, the Dawn is the one that... Um, this one went to... Um, yeah, Ceres and, uh, and Vesta. Rosetta was launched in 2004. Flyby of Stenson. It's very hard for me to read that. Wasn't Dawn the one that read? Read? So What's that? Which one are you Dawn? Oh. Rosetta. I've got it blown up 500 times on my screen here and I can read it all. Okay. But, uh, what are the two? They what are the two? They um, I'm trying to find Rosetta. Let me go across. To, I got a tiny little window here. Galileo. Let's try go up again. Lu Lucia, Lucia, I think is the the one you were looking at. It's yeah, that's the yeah. Then down here, there's the Stardust spacecraft flyby of asteroid Anne Frank. And Frank as an asteroid? Yes. Is asteroid Bray on it now, yeah. Deep Space One. Cassini. Okay. Flew by uh, Mazursky. Galileo went by asteroid Gaspra and Ida. I remember that. Near Shoemaker went by the asteroid Mathilda. Hayabusa 2. Mission target asteroid 1999 JU3, launched December 22, 2014. That's the Japanese one. And that brought back samples, I think. That's Japanese, right? Yeah. And this is the other Hayabusa one, Hayabusa 2. This is Hayabusa 1. I think that one was the one that crashed. They don't count the DART mission to try to nudge a little orbiting asteroid out of it they don't count that dart um you mean the um impact that was an, that was an asteroid we that wasn't dart, aimed dart at, yeah d-a-r-t yeah that's not up there it's not considered um, one of the let's see you might be right i guess they're only counting misses misses <laughs> Yeah, I don't see Dart here anywhere. Yeah, that's that's the one I was asking about. I thought it might have been the Dawn, but it Dart, no. that's the one that they bumped that yeah. they bumped it to see if they could redirect it. Okay. Hmm. Well, I, so anyway, this is this is the parachute and return. I believe this is taken from either a satellite or uh an aircraft of the um uh, what are we the ones we're talking about right now? It's the sample return for um, Rex. You can see the parachute and it's got terrain down here. And I think there's a road back here. It actually landed next to. <clears throat> and this is that capsule that we see on there. And this is it in, in where it landed. Yep, perfectly. <laughs> yep. And this one... Um, the whole spacecraft didn't come. It's just the uh, capsule return that came. And here they are inspecting it, photographing it, and they're also taking samples of the soil around here. You see there are different flags around here where they took soil samples. They want to check those against the information or the soil they have in the container to make sure that it hasn't been contaminated. So if they see the signature of this soil in there, they'll know that they screwed up. You suppose they're in the Great Basin, not far from Salt Lake City? They're in a place called Dugway Proving Grounds for back in the 60s or early 70s. The um, army killed a lot of sheep with nerve gas accidentally. Oh. If you remember the Dugway incident. Yeah, it's the Moki Dugway. 
So this is a desert area. Utah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a proving ground. It's a it's a, a military reservation. Bill Doyle's up there right now, but he said he was pretty far away from this site. Okay. I wonder there how they, they are. They pack. They packaged it up and towed it away by a helicopter from the site to the to the laboratory. And here they are unpacking the um, the helicopter um, package, unwrapping the delivery. And here it is finally in the clean room. Yep. Looks a lot like the Huygens that went down on Titan. You know, that picture of it in the clean room disturbed me because how is the uh, capsule clean? It landed in the, in the desert when they picked up all kinds of junk. Well, I'm, I'm sure that they do some kind of decontamination because they don't want to mix. They would have picked up, as you point out, they would have picked up dirt and dust when the thing hit, and it's on the outside of the capsule. And <clears throat> they may have an outside layer that comes off and is discarded. And then they, they probably do some kind of, and I'm speculating here, but they probably do some kind of a cleaning on the inner capsule. <clears throat> the nitrogen uh, purged this. I, I, I understand that the nitrogen is, is something that doesn't, I, I don't understand it, but they use nitrogen a lot to purge the, these samples to keep well, the nitrogen. Pure, pure dry nitrogen was used on Bennu to cause the, to disrupt the surface and throw everything into suspension, and then they collected it. So it's been exposed to nitrogen. But, but I, think it, I, think they, nitrogen. I, I think they, I think they, I think they purged the, the capsule here with nitrogen as well, is what I read. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nitrogen is a pretty interesting gas. They, uh, yeah. It only hurts us if we get the bends coming up too fast in the water. And yet uh, every time you open a new bag of potato chips, it's nitrogen that comes out and joins in when we breathe it's it. It's easy. It's very easy to get very ultra pure nitrogen. It what you do is you take, you take liquid nitrogen and you stick a tube in it and the liquid nitrogen boils and pure nitrogen gas comes up the tube. There's no other contaminant in it. There's no water. The water stays frozen in the nit in the liquid nitrogen, <laughs> as do all other contaminants. So it's a common uh, inert gas to use. And the plant world thrives on it, but it doesn't do a damn thing for us. No, they no, use it CO2. For us too. What? We use Plants it too. Use CO2. Yeah. Carbon dioxide. Yeah, but they also depend on nitrogen as the soil component that they get. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Well, so anyway, that's um, now okay. we're just waiting for results of what they find in that. So that'll be leaking out. No pun intended, I guess. How long yeah. do you think that'll take? Months? Years? Will they tell us something? I think it'll go on for a long time. You know, they're still looking at moon samples brought back on the Apollo missions, and some of them have not uh, been looked at, I guess, yet. <clears throat> well, I can foresee some far side cartoons about tiny little green men. <laughs> are you are you aware of how many science and science fiction and horror movies start this way? Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite was the Andromeda Strain. God knows what they'll release when they open that. You remember Andromeda Strain? Yeah, we, yes. Yeah. Whoa. That was an interesting movie, and it was very interesting because it it uh, had as a its background theme, it had diversity uh, as a problem solving tool, and they called it the odd man out theory. But that is what big corporations use the formalism of that, which they buy from consultants about how to form effective problem solving teams by putting huh. diverse mindsets um, into a team. Yeah. It's a whole different topic that we're not going to get into because that could take hours to discuss. Make a great future topic, Mr. President. Yeah. All right. We'll be in, on top of it. Here we go. Okay, back. So to now we have a um, a new star. Galaxy. All right. Yeah. In NGC 10, 1076. Was yep. it? 1097. 1097. Okay. You're right. 1097. That was so a good this, year. <laughs> this is super <laughs> supernova two 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 oh two three RVE. They even named identified on the eighth of August 
or 8th of September, excuse me. Wow. And lit up that part of the, the galaxy at least? Yep. Right now, it's about magnitude 15. The galaxy Whoa. is ninth magnitude. The star has faded to 15th magnitude. So that's going to take a very big telescope or a long exposure to show it up. Yeah. A six-inch telescope can see under perfect skies to magnitude 13. <clears throat> and each magnitude is two and a half times fainter than the previous one. So 15 is uh, two and a half squared, which is... 6.25. Okay, 6.25 times fainter than what the six inch telescope can see. So you need a, a larger size amateur telescope. It's in the Southern constellation of Fornax, which means the furnace. Right. Uh -huh. And here uh -huh. it is. Yeah, we know uh, how far there's, away. There's no stick figure for Fornax. There's oh. the alpha star. And here's the, the, the um, this is where the NGC 1097 is. Wow. Okay. So somewhere and down here is a familiar star. Let's see. Sculptor Galaxy. No. Yeah, 253. Yeah. Sculptor will have 253 in it. I've got a real good picture of the supernova that was in M82 um, several years ago. You did? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So anyway, this one is past its prime, but uh, worth noting. Would it be fair to say, gentlemen, that uh, here's what I heard. Uh, our galaxy gets one supernova on the average per 100 years. Is that right? Did I hear that right? Mm -hmm. I think it, it's right. That's right. Okay. So if that were the average of, let's say, all the galaxies, pretty much, some get more, some get, you know, millennia go by. But this is a rare thing we've just seen. It's not happening all the time. Uh, if it happened in our galaxy, it's a rare thing. We find supernovas in galaxies almost every night. Right. Well, when Betelgeuse goes, that's going to be a minus magnitude, isn't it? That's Yeah, that's going to be in our galaxy, and that will be spectacular. See it in the daytime. Jeez. May have already gone. How far yeah, is the, Betelgeuse six, away from us? 600 years. 600, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> So it could have happened 300 years ago and the light's halfway here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't post the distance of this galaxy that had that flame up. You know how many thousands? Didn't of I? I would guess 20, 20 million light years at least. If it's, near the sculptor, if it's near the sculptor group. 20 million? Easily. We can, we can, well, we wouldn't have seen the star before the blow up, I guess. We, it takes a supernova to see it, but the whole galaxy just sort of brightens like a light. Here, this this is the this is that part of the galaxy with the supernova. Mm -hmm. Ah, and the whole and the circle down below that's without and the circle. This is before. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, so, got it. Hmm. It might be that, but it might not be. And that's a spiral, I guess. It's a weird looking. This thing. is a this is a barred spiral. Bard. Our galaxy is a barred spiral, also. With two arms, apparently. Yeah, this has two major arms. Some of them have four. And then a lot I... of sub-arms out here. Okay. And it's got it. another galaxy in the background or one interacting with it. Huh. So all those upper elements are being born right now in that galaxy star. Yes, all the heavy elements. Suddenly we get, what, cadmium and... I you're wondering why the middle of that galaxy is a. I wonder why the middle of that galaxy is a nice bright circle. Yeah, assuming that's not an artist's rendering. No, this is a photograph. Oh, no, it's an image. It's a nice, a nicely processed one too. It has a nice yellowish core of old stars. It has the blue hot young stars out in the arms. And it has red hydrogen alpha emission uh, nebula forming new some of the new blue stars. Right. So and is, Jerry, this... Jerry, if you look at the very top there, you'll see a very distant galaxy right, right there. there. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. When you take pictures of galaxies like this, it's not uncommon to find other ones in the background. I think uh, Paul Wynn 
a member of our club um, a while ago took a picture of, what was it? Um, one of the ones up around the Big Dipper and he found like 60 other galaxies in the background. Sure. They looked like distorted stars, but it was very dramatic. But old man Messier, when he labeled them, didn't know they were galaxies, did he? He just classified didn't them. care. He didn't, I know, but he was looking for movement. He yeah. was looking for comets. No money in galaxies. Did Anything? you want to know the distance of 1097? It, it's 48. Yeah, what is it, Tim? 48 million light years. Okay, so I, I said 20, so I saw a five factor two. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's out there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, this is tomorrow at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. this, sh this shows the sky um, <clears throat> around the region of, is this the morning sky? Is that what I'm under? Well, yeah, Jupiter's coming up a 410 now here. Oh, yeah. So, I saw Jupiter in the, um, uh, the, the uh, picture you have. This is a picture of the sky in the morning. Oops, excuse me, wrong control. We're gonna nail down Mercury and Venus here in a minute. Is that no, we're looking for Neptune and Uranus. Oh, oh, okay. See, see there's there's Neptune in here, and Uranus is over at the other end. Mm -hmm. Past right. Jupiter, there's Uranus down there, right <laughs> near the Pleiades. And the reason this finder chart is here like this, so that um, let's see, in Aries. New Horizons and Hubble are teaming up this week to observe gas giants Uranus and Neptune. Wow. NASA has put out a call for amateur astronomers to image the planets and help with the campaign. Now, that, that's very interesting. Um, you need a very large telescope if you happen to have like a 60 or 100 inch telescope in your backyard <laughs> and, and you're high up on a mountaintop, I could see you you imaging these planets for NASA. But with our backyard stuff, we these things just look like dots. Yeah. A, typical, a typical star with here at sea level, if you're lucky, you can get under three arc seconds resolution with your star. That is the star will be two or three arc seconds in diameter for a point. The, the, the planet's uh, Neptune is two arc seconds in diameter from us, and Uranus is four. So they're right at that limit. So we're not going to be able to share a much detailed surface information unless you have a fairly big telescope. And in order to get the resolution you need to contribute to this, you need to be way up on a mountaintop because the enemy, the thing that makes the star images be big like that, and three seconds here is big, um, is the atmosphere wiggle or what we call seeing so you you need to be up on a mountaintop so or in um, space well can i ask a question about second saturday star parties um saturn we can see straight yeah. up because there's trees around that whole area we meet at in the dark these that we're looking at here we can't see at a star party can we they're always no, visual. what oh, excuse me they're just, they're you always they're always just above the horizon, aren't they? No, they they come they go as high as see Uranus is next to Jupiter, and Jupiter is very high. You're just not used to these because they're faint. They're like seventh or eighth magnitude. You can't see that with your naked eye, even from a dark sky. And and here in Santa Barbara, we're not a dark sky by any means. So well, they, they pointed Jupiter, the word Jupiter gets to be fifty arc seconds across, and uh, Saturn gets to be about thirty or something up there. So those are nice sizes. You can see detail on them. Wow. These are, those will be 10 times the size of Uranus and Neptune. Well, other than Saturn, you guys are just seeing dots. Saturn gives you the ears. <laughs> well, no, we with Saturn, you can see bands and stuff on it. Mostly oh, yeah. photos. Yeah. With your telescopes? Okay. Easily. Yeah. Easily. Oh, yeah. damn. And you can see See, the famous thing to look for is the gaps in the rings, like the Enke gap. And oh, you, what is it? The Cassini gap? Mm -hmm. Cassini just, division. Yeah, division. It's a, the big division between the A and the B rings. Yeah. You can see those in your telescopes? Is that Yeah, big? easily. Easily. Yeah. Wow. You need, a pre, you need a pretty steady night to crack the Cassini division. 
Uh, you know, I've seen it with the eight inch at Westmont. I've seen it here in the backyard um, with my 12 and a half that I built. One uh, night, but one night up by uh, Camino Cielo, we, uh, we had an 18 inch scope. That's Joe Doyle. It was two in the morning and we had a really steady sky. He mm -hmm. filled the eyepiece with Saturn and it was incredible. You could see all the detail on the rings, colors on the surface, the shadows mm -hmm. going onto the surface. It was mm -hmm. really something. This moon suddenly blotting things out. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, moon, the moon is going to be full, I think, on Thursday this week, and it's going to be the hardest moon. Now, here is the Helix Nebula, which we looked at last week. Right. But on this night, you're going to have no chance of, of seeing it <laughs> tail in it. So that's why the focus is on Neptune and Uranus down here. It's um, you can see that the planet is there you won't see a lot of detail on it. But Jupiter's right here, and that will show a lot of detail. Jerry, what time is this here? I think it's 11 o'clock. It's, it's for 11 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the 26th, okay. tomorrow. Okay. And, and I this will appear a little green, and Neptune will appear a little bit more to the blue. Uh, little, yes. Little yeah. dots. <laughs> Someday they're going to send a NASA mission to the moon and they're going to land on Clavius. And you know what? I'm going to predict that they're going to name it the Kubrick mission. <laughs> Kubrick mission. I already bought you a one-way ticket, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently you can only get one-way tickets to Mars. That's true. You're right. <laughs> Lord. Fascinating stuff, gentlemen. Both okay, now here. this. The chart, harvest moon. That's, that's just before the sun comes up, that one. This wow. one is 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, Leo, I can just yeah. see the sickle coming up just ahead of the sun here in yeah. the northeast. And I did this at this time to show Mercury its move to the morning sky. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that, and it's just, and you can see that the sky is starting to brighten in, the, in this planetary yeah. show. And, and Venus is just Leo. magnificent now. Yeah, Venus is magnificent now. It's way high. Yeah. Venus is right there. In and Leo. very bright. Mm. Here's the beehive cluster up here. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what um, Tom was talking about, Leo right here, recognizing it. All right. Well, tell me that you guys zero in on Venus at our star parties. That's always way behind those trees. Well, isn't it? It's a morning item now, Ron. Yeah. yeah. Well, when it's in the evening, half the year it's in the evening. Uh, yes, yeah. that's pretty easy to get. But yeah, we'll have to wait Venus. till next year. Well, Venus is hard to get, even though it's big. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's 72 arc seconds across <laughs> the, um, because it comes fairly close to us. But you never see much detail on Venus. No. So. But you can, get, you, you can get nice pictures of crescents and di the different phases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to tell you, I'm getting old because we just had a full moon. Here's another one. That's pretty yep. damn fast. 28 days. My God. Yeah, 29 days for phase. 29. Yeah, the, the phase day. cycle is 29.3. This is the harvest. This harvest is the moon. harvest moon. Get the, get the pumpkins out of the field. Now, this is, this, this is the last super moon of the year mm -hmm. called the harvest moon. Um, it, it is at full phase at, uh, on Thursday evening at uh, 2 50, or Thursday morning, I guess it is, at 2.58 a.m., 3 o'clock, basically. The, um, it's the last supermoon of the year, and it's the um, fourth of four in a row. So, And it's a supermoon, or did you say it? Did I miss that? Yeah, it's a supermoon. It's the last supermoon of the year. Oh, okay. That means it's in close. That yes, it's at... It, it's um, full at its perihelion. Perihelion, as opposed to perigee. What's the difference between perihelion and perigee? Oh, he, he meant perigee. I meant perigee, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, then there is such a word. Perihelion is close to the sun. Pere oh, oh, I yeah, got you. Um, ap apogee is the opposite. Perigee is close to the earth. It's so mm -hmm. apogee mm -hmm. would be the farthest from the earth, right? Mm -hmm. ap is there mm -hmm. such a yeah. word as apohelium? Yeah. Apogee. Okay. And there's Apoluna and Paraluna. <laughs>
Personally, I like applesauce, but that's okay. We're not going <laughs> to yeah, harvest moon. And Nishimura's back. We got 10 minutes. You ready to switch or you want to? 10 minutes? Well, let's 12. What have yeah, we got let's... here? Oh, it's gone fast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried and tried to get that thing in the morning sky a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But now this was an accidental photograph they weren't expecting as it went around taken by what's yeah this they call this a um photo what are they photo photo bomb photo bomb out of nowhere comes this yeah they were, the nasa spacecraft is taking a picture of the sun it's mm -hmm. the uh, solar stereo for solar terrestrial relations observatory <laughs> spacecraft stereo a it took a picture of the sun's outer atmosphere the corona on september 19 and it got this picture of, Nish, of Nishimura. And so the thing is that the Nishimura appears to have been not conclusively, but likely to have survived its perihelion. Oh, okay. And so it may be a comet again, but it's going to be in the Southern Hemisphere mm -hmm. and uh, not for us. Right. Yeah, it dove really fast, Jerry. <laughs> it, yeah, it put, it passed um, 20.5 million miles from the sun, mm -hmm. which is 25% of an AU. Yeah. And that's where stereo is? Stereo, no. Stereo, stereo pick, took a picture. So the fact that it got that and the sun in the same time, it's going to be uh, quite a far away. Well, don't, don't we have a probe orbiting? Yeah, the Parker probe. Parker probe. Or, that uh, or, dips in toward the sun every every periodic every periodically. But does it send back pictures? Um, it sends back data and some pictures. Mostly, it sends back data of streaks because that's the um, um, particle radiation from the sun going through the camera detector. <clears throat> and so now, if you track the uh, orbit of uh, Nishimura, it's going back to the what asteroid belt or the Oort cloud? Or did we decide on that? Do we know? Nishimura has, I think it has a, a period of 480 years. It's a periodic comet. Well, that seems to be fast. We were just looking at it in the night sky and now it went around the sun within a week. That's fast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it came fairly close to the earth. Went zip through here. Well, 400 years makes it me think it goes further than the asteroid belt. It's not an asteroid-based comet. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a star chart. This is a finder chart of the environs of Cassiopeia, the famous W, which is cleverly obscured by the uh, planetarium software adding too many lines. <laughs> but the famous W, which you will pick out naturally in the sky, <clears throat> is this one, this one, this one. And there. <clears throat> and there's a lot of really interesting stuff. It's one of my favorite parts of the sky. There is the bubble nebula and M52, an open star cluster up here. Uh, there's the double cluster down here, the little dumbbell over here. And then, of course, Andromeda. And on the other side of Mirac is M33. The, you got 457 up in. Up in in the middle of, the, of Cassiopeia there, the owl cluster. Yeah. Just saw that last week, Tim, in the uh, uh, eight inch. It's right it's, next to the root ball there. It, it, it's, it's not marked, Jerry, but yeah. Yeah, but I don't see it. Tim yeah. and I know how to star hop to it, yeah. It's right okay. there, where you were. Right here? No, a little higher. Oh, no, no. Right above the root ball. Right above the root ball, the, the end of root ball. Right above the A in the end of root ball. Right there. This, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it kind of makes okay, a little well, triangle. It is here. marked, it's just not labeled. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but M103 is here too. Yeah. Wow. This is a very rich area. This the um we Milky Way the Christmas goes tree. through here. Yeah. 103 <clears throat> is a Christmas tree. Oh yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh wow, and the blue snowball up there too. Mm-hmm. Yep. The nebula. Did you point out star cluster M52? And did I miss it? Or is that what this nope, is? No, we're doing it right now. Oh, okay. This is M52. Mm -hmm. And this is the bubble nebula. Yeah. And this is about what you would see in a few frames of an amateur uh, telescope photograph. 
<clears throat> you can easily see this with the naked eye, not this dense in stars. And you can kind of get a hint of the bright, brightest spot of the bubble nebula, but you get to see the bubble in um, longer exposures. I photographed it a number of times. The following is not one of my photographs, but it shows the bubble nebula <laughs> from a major telescope. <laughs> if so that this, was your photograph, boy. <laughs> yeah, right. So there's a lot of nebulosity, a lot of dark nebula and illuminated uh, gas around them. <laughs> it's a rich part of the Milky Way. I can see a far side cartoon with an alien and a big round thing dipped into a jar of soap. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I uh, love it. But now, the, just out of curiosity, Cassiopeia, the W, can it be seen by the Southern Hemisphere, astronomers in Australia? No. Are yeah, they, I'm, I'm going to guess no, because it, no. it's, it's a circumpolar object for us in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see it almost any time of the year. Right. Yeah, Ron, it doesn't get very far from the North Star. Okay, so it's so far if up. If you're the far north. south, you can't see the North Star. Can they can they see most of uh, of uh, Orion? Yes, oh, yeah. yes, they easily see Orion. But they see it the same way we do. Or it's upside it up? down. <laughs> yeah. It looks upside down. I used oh, it to does? planetarium. Okay. You know, when I taught for City College, you, I, 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 took, I uh, when I visited uh, Australia uh -huh. for a total eclipse of the sun, I got to view the night sky. Um, the Magellanic clouds stand out. And oh, yes, yes. Um, 47 Tucana, which is a mm -hmm. very bright globular cluster. It's, it looks like a fuzzy star. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea how disorienting a familiar <laughs> sky upside down is. I couldn't recognize any constellations. I finally found the great square of Pegasus. And of course, a square that's upside down is still a square. Yeah, but from then I started moving outward and I could slowly, oh, that's upside down Orion. Oh, that's yeah. So but it's hey, Jerry, you know just, that planetarium in the planetarium is really neat to show this. Jerry, too. can I just ask a quick quick question from Mary Migrant on online here? She wanted to know why we get four supermoons in a row. How can we get four in a row like that? It just takes that long for the um moon in its full phase to move through. Um, it's perihelion in the orbit. It what slowly happened? precesses. The orbit slowly precesses. And so um, where, the, where the moon becomes full as the year goes on, if, if you sit down and make an ellipse on a piece of paper and play with the geometry, you'll see what happens. I hope that's okay, Mary. Yeah, one of our new members. Hello there, Mary Migrant. See you at this big party in a week. She should, if she wants to ask us questions, she can join this as you know, get a little. Sure. Well, she she joined our meeting, our business meeting yeah. a couple of weeks Good. ago. Why not? <clears throat> More the merrier. More the merrier on our this, screen. This um, this shows the moon over here, just out of the field of view, and mm -hmm. this is Saturn, which is a bright object, and the object that Astronomy Magazine suggests for this evening, which is. I think it's Thursday evening. Let's see. The 28th. Yeah, Thursday evening. This is at 9 o'clock. And the, um, the Saturn moon Iapetus is removed from Saturn enough, and it, but it's quite faint. So the object is to try and spot Iapetus while the full moon is just out of the field over here. Titan cool boy. Titan, you'll easily be able to see. Um, but these fainter moons are more of a challenge. This would be larger scopes, 12 inch or 18 inch or something. Wow. But this is the moon pattern that you'd have at nine o'clock on Thursday evening from Santa Barbara. Is Iapetus a, an, an ice ball, you suppose? You know, I think pretty much they all are. Um, Iapetus is the one that's. Well, Titan isn't. Titan's got lake. No. Methane. Yeah. Iapetus is the, is that the two-faced one, the one that's white on one side and dark on the other? I don't know, Jerry. I'd have to or, look it up. Or is that a Jupiter moon? We should know that, gentlemen. You're well, your your uh, uh, caption for the picture says the two-faced moon Iapetus. 
There yeah. you go. Okay, then that's nice it. Yeah. Challenge. We're not going to have much time to cover that disc being formed around a planet around a distant uh, star. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. We've got just enough. So time this to... is a hot topic in uh, planetary and planetary formation research right now. This is a dust ring around the central star, okay. and this is where planets are forming and other things. And this is a planet going around that star. It's a direct image. This is a radio telescope image, but it's a direct image of the planet, an exoplanet orbiting its star. That's why the star looks so funky. And then there's these nodules here, which um, appear to be a set of four or five moons forming around this planet. This is a Jupiter-sized planet, slightly larger than Jupiter. So mm -hmm. they like in this to the equivalent of the four Galilean moons. Oh. Wow. That's so an incredible they're watching one. this and photographing it and measuring the motions of these things and seeing what happens. Well, we're not going to see those moons made in our lifetime, are we? If we wait around, none of this is going to congeal until... No. Jerry, is, um, is this Webb that did this? Is what? Is this no, Webb? No, it's airspace. It was airspace it's radio. It's radio, radio, Tim. It's radio. Oh, okay. okay. Radio waves, yeah. This is from ALMA. Huh. Okay, down what? South America. Yeah. Well, I wonder why they're not doing that with radio telescopes all over the place. I This is the first time I've seen a picture of an extra, or what do they call them, exoplanet? Exoplanet, yeah. You know, they no, got there's a, a couple of other ones where they, with radio waves, they see it. Wow, okay. The, sun, the stars don't shine so brightly in radio waves. Mm -hmm. This so. one doesn't have a name, but it's in it our does. galaxy. It's very romantic. It's <laughs> PDS 70. Ah, wow. And the planet is PDS 70C, and we've run out of time. Yes, and this, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah my heart just jumped, Jerry. It's <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, it's been awesome. I've learned a lot. I just hope I keep it up here under this damn beret I wear. But we got a big uh, night coming up in two Fridays. I hope you're all going to enjoy. We'll be back in their little uh, auditorium called Farron Hall for a, a Zoom uh, science uh, talk from a gentleman yeah. named Ben. We'll be we'll be out Thursday night too with some moon tan lotion. All right, moon well, tan lotion. And don't forget, up. in two and a half weeks there is a uh, eclipse of the sun that we oh, will nice. view from yep. the marketplace. Yep. Yep. Camino okay. Real. Are we going to be out there at Camino Real for that? Yep. And uh, Tim, uh, are you on board tomorrow night for, or uh, certainly Jerry is, right? You run the uh, webs, the telescope. Web, uh, yeah, we're going to, yeah, we, we've got some discussions to do on uh, workshop on, on tube flexure tomorrow night. Is our public invited to join in? Can you see it on YouTube? Where do you see it? You're talking about two things. One is Telescope Tuesday tomorrow night at the Marketplace. The other one is we have the telescope workshop on uh, Zoom tomorrow night. That's cool, why man. I don't show up for Telescope Tuesday. And if we haven't lost our outreach coordinator to the jury system, we'll somehow <laughs> plot ahead without him. <laughs> Take care of yourself. About the, uh, uh, comment about the new projector in the planetarium, which is you know wonderful images. Oh, oh when you're great. sitting over near the outside, uh, I was getting a. Uh, Quite a bit of blindness from the uh, stray light out of the projectors. They need to put a, 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 a shield underneath them so that none of the light can actually shine down into the uh -huh. audience. Okay. Well, make that suggestion to, to John. Uh, okay. You got it. 